Rodney, you're coming out of the University of Georgia in 1990. Were you surprised that you were still around at 24? Yeah, I was surprised. I thought I was going to get picked in uh, the top 10, but that didn't happen. Then I was looking at 15, 16, 17, but when uh, Giants finally called my name at 24, I was, uh, I was happy. I was happy that I, I went in the first round. O.J. Anderson had had a great year in 1989, and the Giants had obviously a very good football team. Were you surprised that the Giants took you? No, I wasn't surprised. I know O.J. was at the... Uh, he was an older running back, so I guess they were looking to get a younger back. Well, you know, I was just a 21-year-old guy out of college, out of University of Georgia my first year. I was just happy to be there. In true team spirit, the veteran O.J. Anderson would take the young Hampton under his wing. I knew when you draft a guy number one, he has the ability, and that means that you're going to be on the bench eventually, as soon as he was ready. So I was kind of hurt a little bit, but then I said, you know what? I could help him be the best he could be, so I took the mentoring role of doing that. We had O.J. Anderson, the grandfather of the group. He just taught me to lift things, you know, how to get prepared for the game and stay warm, stay loose. So O.J. meant a lot to me. All right, so you go to training camp, FDU Madison, and there's Phil Sims, there's Lawrence Taylor, there's Mark Bavaro, there's Carl Banks. There's all these guys that I'm sure you watched win the Super Bowl in 1986. When you're out there on that practice field with all these veterans, Pepper Johnson, uh, what, what's going through your mind? Did you feel like you fit? Yeah, I felt, I mean, you know, it's a great situation uh, for me because you had, you know, uh, the veteran leadership. You know, I uh, also, you know, Maurice Carton. Maurice was uh, a guy that I really looked up to and he kept me in line. But, uh, you know, like you say, the leadership, you know, Pepper Johnson, LT, Carl Banks, and on the offensive side of the ball, you had to feel Sims was a great leader. So I just had to come in and uh, play ball. Rodney would have an impressive debut for Big Blue, scoring his first career touchdown in week one versus the Eagles. Rodney would record over 800 all-purpose yards and four touchdowns in his rookie season, helping the Giants jump out to one of their best starts in franchise history. The team starts off 10-0 in 1990 and you guys are really clicking what was it about that team that felt special just the leadership you know what i mean we didn't score a lot of points but uh giants was known for the hard nose defense you know and then uh, on the offense uh, side of the ball we scored 10 13 points we feel like we're gonna win we had a great offensive line you know what i mean uh when i got here and then we had great people around you know we had a veteran quarterback phil sims he can audible and he put us in good situation and uh, you know i just knew i was wrong you know some great talent phil sims goes down in the buffalo game in the regular season jeff hostetler has to come in did you get a sense that this team could rally around hostetler well like i say we had a uh, a lot of leaders on our football team and Jeff was just waiting for his opportunity. And when Phil went down, my Jeff coming in, he was more mobile than Phil. So that just, you know, uh, helped the offense out a little bit more because, you know, uh, he can take off on third and three or pick up the first down and uh, keep the drive going. So, you know, he was a, a talented quarterback. Despite the loss of Phil Sims, the Giants would forge ahead. Hampton had given the big blue offense an added dimension with his combination of power and speed. New York finished the season with a record of 13-3 and, and were poised for a deep playoff run. But early on in the divisional playoff game at home against the Bears, Rodney would go down with a leg injury that ended his season. Well, I just know injuries is a part of it. First thing I said, whoa, I'm glad I came out a year early. I, you know, <laughs> I came out my junior year at the University of Georgia. That could have happened in college. So, you know, I know injuries happen, nothing I can do about it, but I just know I just had to stay focused and work out hard and try to bounce back for the following season. But uh, we went on to won a Super Bowl, so I felt that I was a part of the uh, Super Bowl team. Giants on the one and a half yard line. OJ touchdown! OJ's second touchdown in the Super Bowl game. As you're watching OJ do what he's doing the rest of the way, uh, was it going through your mind at all? That could have been me. No, I never think about that. I just tell OJ every time I see him, I say, hey, man, you got to uh, think about me. If I wouldn't have got hurt, you wouldn't have got that Super Bowl MVP. So we laugh about it and everything. But uh, OJ had to play well for us to win that football game because we had to keep the ball away from Buffalo. You know, they had a high potent offense. So, you know, we, he had to get all the yards that he did for us to have a chance to win. Now, Otis Anderson will end up his career. Yes, the most valuable player. 
It couldn't happen to a better guy. You know, OJ uh, put in his time and uh, had a great career. And uh, yeah, I was happy for, for the whole team. Following the Giants' title run in 1990 and their victory at Super Bowl 25, Bill Parcells would step down as head coach of the Big Blue. I was disappointed because when Parcells left, we got Ray Hanley, which was my running back coach. And then when he came in, you know, everything just went down. So that's when I knew how great of a coach that Bill Parcells was, and, and I did miss him. Despite their championship hangover in 1991, Rodney would be a bright spot for the G-Men. He had his first 1,000-yard rushing season while recording 10 touchdowns. And in 1992, the Giants' workhorse would arguably have his best year, rushing for over 1,100 yards and a career-high 14 touchdowns. The handoff is to Hampton. He's got some room inside the five. Hampton scores. Dan Reeves was hired in 1993. You know, you guys bounce right back. Right. And now you're a good football team. He loved the run game. Talk about playing for Coach Reeves in that first year in 93, because you guys had a team that could have won the Super Bowl that year. Yeah, we did. And, uh, and uh, Dan Reeves, like I said, that's my uh, favorite uh, head coach, you know, in the NFL. I mean, you know, he's a players coach, but, you know, he mean business. He's going to do it his way. And uh, everybody played hard for him. And so he was great. With Reeves manning the helm, the Giants would make it back to the playoffs in his first season as head coach. And on a cold day in January, Hampton and company hosted the Minnesota Vikings in the NFC wildcard game. In a smash mouth affair between two of the league's best defensive teams, both squads dished out some serious punishment. But the Vikings would strike the first blow. Back to Graham, double side end. Makes the handoff, bootlegs right, he might run. He's gonna throw a long way down and it's I look at the Minnesota game in the playoff game when we was behind and after halftime we came in and everything started clicking. The running game started clicking, found some creases and bust some long runs. Hampton gets the call going right, finds a hole right, gets the cross for 40, 35, he's down the right side, he might score! I probably had over 150 yards and scored two touchdowns in the second half. Hands off, half the inside the five. We got a couple turnovers, and defense was solid like always, and, you know, we won a football game. And these fans are going to be thrilled at the turnaround season that Dan Reeves and his coaching staff have given them. Tremendous game and a great victory. The Giants' championship hopes would be dashed one week later in a 44-3 drubbing at San Francisco. And the loss signaled the end of an era for Big Blue, as Phil Simms and Lawrence Taylor both announced their retirement following the 1993 season. Well, my thing was that uh, I can't control nothing. You know, everything for, you know, for the management and all that stuff, I can't control. I just got to, you know, uh, take care of my job and hopefully everything fall in places. But, you know, the free agency and guys retiring, that's out of my hands. So, you know, my thing, you know, play football, keep your mouth closed and uh, try to be productive. All right, well, you were always productive. And look, that was a team that wasn't necessarily the highest level of passing game that existed at that point. So it was on Rodney Hampton. How did you deal with the pressure of having to basically carry an offense? Like I said, it wasn't no pressure. It's the only pressure when you're not prepared. That's why I look at it. So I just went out and played my game. You know, I never got caught up in talking to the media and reading the papers and the clips, how good you is and all that. I just went out and, you know, looked at my game plan and seen what I had to do and tried to do it to the best of my ability. In 1995, Rodney Hampton would continue his rampage on the record books, breaking his own team mark by registering a fifth consecutive 1,000-yard season and becoming the Giants' all-time leading rusher, surpassing Joe Morris's prior record 
of 5,296 career rushing yards. Rodney Hampton gets the car. Hampton cuts the corner. Hampton inside the 40. Gets a block. Rodney Hampton inside the 15. Hampton would set another Giants team record when he rushed for four touchdowns against the New Orleans Saints. And once you get that momentum change, you know, you feel like, you know, everything, you know, clicking. And I wanted the ball more, and when I want the ball, the offensive linemen, they, they like getting dirty, so, so they want to block. Hampton in for a touchdown. In for Hampton on his way up the middle, Rodney to the two, touchdown Giants. Hampton for a fourth time, he's in for a touchdown. We scored some short touchdown runs, but the main thing, we won the game, and it was great. You had uh, a real knack for scoring. What was it about you that enabled you to be such a good scoring running back in those tight areas? To tell the truth, when I first came in, I was more like a scat back, a big bad, like 220, you know, can make people miss in open field. And then, you know, I started having a knee problem, so I had to change my game to a, a pounder, but I still had the vision and, you know, ability to make people miss in, uh, in small spaces. So that's what it was. You know, I wasn't always a pounder, and that wasn't my thing to come in and be a pounder, but, you know, and, and he kept on getting hurt and started gaining weight, and I often went throwing the ball a lot. So I just used that ability to change my game to be inside the tackle runner. Did you have to change the way you trained just because of the pounding that you knew you were going to take? Uh, as you got into those middle years? Not really, because I wasn't big in the weight room. You know, we got to lift a lot of weights. So I just try to, you know, uh, make sure, you know, I uh, work on my vision and, you know, uh, cutting ability and all that. You know, just focusing in on the game plan, make sure I'm doing my assignments right. But, you know, I got, I got beat up a lot <laughs> at the you know, end of my career. Despite Rodney's record-breaking year in 1995, the Giants were trying to avoid finishing in the basement of the NFC East. In week 16, they traveled to Dallas, where Hampton would put forth the best single game rushing effort of his career, tallying 187 yards on the ground. Unfortunately, the end result was painfully symbolic of the Giants' 1995 season, as they lost to the Cowboys on a last second field goal. Did you ever really get frustrated when things started to really take a turn for the worse with the team and you knew that I won a championship as a rookie. Mm -hmm. In 93, we were good enough to win a championship and now it seems like we don't really have a shot. Um, How did you deal with that mentally? Well, I mean, some guys play their whole career and never make it to the playoffs. And I was blessed, you know, I didn't play in the Super Bowl, but was, you know, was fortunate enough to be on the team that we won a Super Bowl. And then, you know, we have a, we had our ups and downs. It's like a roller coaster ride, but, you know, never got frustrated, you know, because things can turn around. So that's just a part of it. 1997, Jim Fossil comes in, and you guys get back to the postseason. You become the Giants' all-time leading rusher, but you retire. How hard a decision was that for you? Not hard at all. I've been blessed to play this game, and coming in, my goal was to play three to four years. I played eight seasons with the New York Giants, and a great organization, glad to be here, great family, and uh, by coming into this family, being a part of the team, it was great. I wasn't traded in for nothing in the world, and that's why when I got to the end of my career, I could have went another place and played, but I just wanted to play for one team and with the New York Giants. What did it mean to you to become the franchise all-time leading rusher? Because when you retired, you held the record for the most rushing yards. Pretty storied franchise Correct. with a great tradition. To have that record, you knew eventually it would probably get broken, which Tiki eventually broke it. But to have that record, was that was that something that you were real proud of? Well, was, you're proud of record, but records get broken all the time. You know, I don't. I'm not a big guy. Look at your stats and you know say that because. They're always going to be somebody that either got a chance to break your rockets, you know, but we had the guy came in behind me, Tiki, wow, he put up big numbers, you know, and uh, it depends on what kind of offense you're in. You know, when Tiki came in, we had, well, we threw the ball a lot, so you had a balanced attack, uh, but rockets get broken all the time. When you come back up to the area, whether it's to the old Giants Stadium or MetLife Stadium, uh, or even around town, you see people and there's fans that wear jerseys and there's a 27 jersey and there's still a lot of guys that wear it says Hampton yeah. on the back. Um, yeah. How does that make you feel? It made me feel good because in New York, these fans are passionate about their football. They're going to let you know when you're doing well, and they're going to let you know when you're messing up. You know, these people paid to see you perform, and, you know, you didn't want to let them down. You just want to go out and, you know, have fun and let them enjoy the game. And hopefully at the end of the day, 
you know, uh, you got to win. You do a lot of charitable stuff for the Giants. Mm -hmm. How important is it to uh, give back to the community? I know you work with kids back in your hometown of Houston. You're up here. You do a lot of things for the Giants as an ambassador. Well, what does that mean? It, it feels good. I'm, uh, my thing, I always want to put a smile on somebody's face when somebody, you know, hey, thank you, Rodney. You know, you want to sign an autograph, a picture, or a shirt or something. Just putting a smile to somebody's face, and then they going into the stadium and enjoy the game. And it's just important. That's just the way I was brought up. You know, my mom and dad always told me, you know, uh, go out and help people. You know, never know when somebody can help help you or somebody who you love. And, you know, now I do the same thing in Houston. I got my charity I set up, Hamps Camp, and I do out school program. I do summer camps at my high school for a week. I come to Newark and Patterson, New Jersey, do a free football camp, have over 100, 200 kids come for free. And uh, just to look on their face just made me feel good because the kids can have a chance to go to something for free and also get an autograph and, you know, just to touch you and say hello. What a night to welcome in the Ring of Honor class of 2022. Happy to be here, Class A organization. It's a bit thrill. You're also yeah. joining a very elite group. Is that yeah. humbling? Yeah, it is. Uh, Leonard Marshall, Joe Morris, and OJ that came before me. Being a rookie, been 21 years old, and been on the veteran team. And my first year, we won 10 games in a row. So I said, we don't lose around here, and went on to win the Super Bowl. So I'm just happy going with these guys. I'm a young puppet, but I'm just happy to be in this great group. And this is a guy who it's my eighth dog right here. And it's uh Junior. That's right, baby. <laughs> little Rod. Little Rod, just like his daddy. He's he a little faster than his daddy. <laughs> Our next honoree was a first round draft pick for the Giants in 1990. A Super Bowl champion. He's second all time in Giants history with just under 7,000 yards rushing. He had five consecutive 1,000 yard seasons. Please welcome number 27, Rodney Hampton. Once a giant, always a giant. It means to me that when I come here, I feel like I'm at home. Placing the jacket on Rodney Hampton is his son, Rodney Hampton Jr. The passion that the fans have and remember all the good things that I did, that made me feel like I'm still a part of this football team. You know, this is one close family and that's where our team was in the early 90s. Won a Super Bowl ring. 